Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from New York Community Bank, Amtrust Title Insurance Company, Perfect Building Maintenance, m and Bank, Customers Bank, Marks Paneth LLP, Aerial Property Advisors, Sterling National Bank, Capital One Bank, Collins Building Services, Meridian Capital Group. Additional support has been provided by grants from AVR Realty Company, Amarant Bank, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, B6 Real Estate Advisors, Briarwood Organization, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Commercial Mortgage, Citizens Bank, CPEX Real Estate Services, Douglaston Development Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handler Properties LLC Handler Real Estate, Hodges Ward Elliott INC, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Matone Group, New Banks, Newmark Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rockefeller Group, Rosewood Realty Services, SJP Properties, Stonehenge NYC, TD Bank, Terra CRG, the Marengo Family Foundation, and these friends. Oh, crystal ball, baby. You are not shiny today. You've, you've seen some changes take place on June 14th, a day that everybody in the real estate business is going to remember as a date that they don't want to remember. Lots of effects have taken place in the rental regulation market, and today I've assembled this group of real estate leaders to provide their insight on what's truly going to happen to a tenant, to an owner, and so on with regard to the rental market. My guests, they include a combination owner and a banker, Joseph Pistelli, chairman of the board of First Central Savings Bank and also the chairman and CEO of Pistelli Realty. Uh, Steve Anacona, who is the principal at uh, Flatiron Real Estate Advisors. Albert Dweck, who is the principal and founder and CEO of Duke Properties. And last but not least, Aaron Young-Rice, who is the founder and principal and CEO of Rosewood Realty. Joe, what happened on June 14th? There was a massacre that took place in the real estate industry in New York City. Something that we've never seen probably in the last 70, 80 years what took place. We completely um, were at the mercy of a pen that changed laws that we've all relied on and related to to make and provide good housing in New York City and has worked for many, many years. That's what happened. And, and this is really for the public to understand. You know, landlords, owners were putting money into properties to improve the property, to make the quality of life, new kitchens, new bathrooms, new amenities over there. And they were spending, you know, they weren't running to a Kia for $12,000. They were spending seventy-five dollars to $100,000 to renovate the, the, the apartment, to make it a quality apartment that somebody wanted to stay at. Now, what's the rule, Steve? Now uh, you're capped at $15,000 for 15 years, which roughly works out to 89, can, bucks. 89 bucks a month, which means nobody's going to do renovations of existing stabilized apartments. Aaron, what happened to the, uh, the for sale? People were looking to sell their properties or buying properties. What happened to the investment sales market? Right now, over the last two weeks, zero. No one wants to buy and no one wants to sell. They want to sell, but they'll never get that price. So there's an absolute standstill. And you, Mr. Positive, Albert, what, what, what's going to happen to the reality of the market? Um, as with any correction, it's going to eliminate people that were short-term thinkers. Uh, it's a long-term business. Uh, we know that. Uh, sitting here, I know, I, know, I know these guys are responsible long-term owners. 
while there was, you know, obviously we all exploited the, the, the opportunity to raise our rents to the maximum to take care of tenants to provide good housing, which we always did and will continue to do. We're just in a much longer term game. So now people come to New York City. They're looking for apartments. And people who are protected under certain of the new regulations are never going to move. It's, uh, it's going to be generation to generation transferring that property. I think it's important to understand the numbers of New York City in particular. Um, New York City what, has 8.5 million residents uh, as of the last census. There's uh, about three, a little more than 3 million households unique to the, in, in the country. Most two-thirds of those households are rentals, right? Half of those two-thirds, so about a million apartments are rent-stabilized. So now you're a new guy coming to the market. It's very expensive to buy. You, can, you can't get into the rent-stabilized because people don't move, like you just said. And now we made it harder for them to move. So now you can only enter one-third of the market. How did we make things more affordable? Aaron? You know, I just I mean, want to you, echo you, what Joe said before. He said it was a massacre. The massacre was on the lower and middle class people in, in New York. That's who it was on. Because the landlords are here, they're here. But the tenants are going to live in poverty. And they're going to live, uh, unfortunately, with buildings that are not maintained like they used to be. And it's going to get worse for them. So the supposedly protected class that they're trying to protect, this city, they're actually making it much worse for What's them. going to happen, you know, a superintendent may have been running one building. Now a landlord has less profitability over there, less income coming in. That superintendent is going to be running two buildings. Or the, so one person's going to lose a job. So that working individual, the, the superintendent, or the other people, the janitor, is now going to be lost. I think the bigger picture is also that the, the law itself literally has put the investor or the property owners who were involved in changing neighborhoods, changing them for the better. They took abandoned buildings. They um, had, had created a safer place to live. They created jobs in those things. But neighborhoods came back to life. Because investors used their own money. If there were tax credits, they were fine. If not, they still used their own money. They used traditional uh, financing to finance those buildings and you had new people coming into those neighborhoods being a part of it. And the word gentrification came about from that. And unfortunately, some elected officials, many of them, believe that the word gentrification is synonymous for displacement of people. And that is the furthest thing from what we want, the neighborhoods want, the people who have been long-term in those neighborhoods want. It's almost the same thinking that when a commercial store business outlives its use that it had 35 and 40 years ago, but he or she, whatever that story, and you, and you talk to them and they can't afford to pay what someone else would pay that would bring something completely different. Maybe a computer store, uh, an iPhone store, something that replaces what they had a long, long time ago. But what, what's going to happen? I mean, you have it, you have all of these people who are recent college graduates who want to come to New York City. Where are they going to find an apartment, okay? They can't afford a market-rate apartment. Yeah, well, they have to share the market-rate apartments, which right. we know they're doing. Which, but it puts more pressure on the market-rate apartments. You know, rent-stabilized apartments are going to go down in value, and market-rate apartments are going to, go, going to become more expensive. What happens to the individual, somebody who had been in an apartment for maybe 10 years, okay, and they were elderly or certain... They were looking forward to somebody like you giving them the opportunity to buy that apartment from them. Okay, even they were a tenant, but to buy the opportunity to take that apartment. They were going to take that seventy-five hundred, two hundred thousand dollars, and use it for their retirement. Right now, what's That's, the status? That That's goes gone. away. Mike, I was talking to someone yesterday, a landlord in Eastern Parkway. He has a woman on the fourth floor of a walk-up. She's in her seventies. And he told her a year ago, when the time comes, I'm going to give you 150000 because she has a heart condition. She went to him the other day to the office, and he said, I don't know her name, but he said, Mrs. So-and-so, I can't give it to you anymore. There's no reason for me to give you the 150000 She had a huge apartment. He was going to renovate it. So she lost her life. Look, but do you they've know, taken for, away. For, for the audience, explain what happened. What the $100,000 and so on. Okay. Tenants had one thing an amazing thing going for them, an amazing asset value, which was a rent-stabilized lease. The city has taken that away from them. 
This, a rent stabilized lease was worth 25, 50, 100, Minimum. 200,000, sometimes a million dollars. The city has taken that away. So if someone unfortunately passes away or gets divorced or there's a death in the family, they have to move to Carolina or Atlanta or upstate New York, wherever, you have an opportunity to go to your landlord and get paid big time for that lease. You don't have that anymore. So there's no reason for the landlord now to go to work. What's the point? There's no upside. There's no reason to invest in a building. And the tenants don't have that rent, that unbelievably valuable rent stabilized lease that they would waive in front of a landlord that on a bad day is worth 25 grand. It's worth zero. I'll give they don't a have a car, but they have a rent stabilized Steve, lease. I'm sorry. I'll give a simpler example. Uh, you know, I've had tenants who are stabilized. They've been there for a second generation. Um, the apartment was never upgraded. They've come to me and said, hey, you know, can, you know we want to fix up the kitchen. Can you do it? Can you spend the $10,000 to fix up our kitchen? I do the math. I say, okay, 10000 divided by 40. It's a reasonable return on the investment. I know you're not going anywhere. Okay, I'll do it for you. No problem. Then increase the rent, though. And increase and the rent. And increase commensurate. the rent by $25, $250 a month, but it was, it was amortized over they were for 40 happy. months. They, they signed to. off on they it. Agreed they to. signed off on it. They agreed to it. We agreed to it. Everybody was happy. Now I can't make that investment. I what, are, what are the new regs? What's the term time limit for <laughs> major capital improvements and what are the, for the individual apartment improvements? So it used to be in the individual apartment improvements for units that were 30, 35, buildings that were 35 units and under 1 40th of every dollar you spent, you got to increase the Over rent. 40 months, right. Over 35 units, it was 1 60th. Unfortunately, that, that got wiped away, where now the, the regs are, it's 1... 1 168th and right. 1 180th, and it's temporary. I believe. Right. And it's only for 30 years. Right. And you have so to how give do you it back. do that? How does a banker uh, wait a do second, that Wait a second, and then you, yeah. you have to give it back. Yeah. And what about right. the major capital improvements? Major capital uh, you improvements. You know, a new boiler, because you know, you have a, when, a large portion of a housing stock. You know, Mike, also, uh, going back to uh, a lot of times our government officials, they really believe they know better and what's right for everybody. And we, we can't walk and chew gum at the same time. They really uh, sometimes get carried away with that thinking. To also change the law to go even beyond that, where a tenant can have the opportunity in a building that would have converted into a co-op building, and they could own a piece of the rock and own and have a state right. So why don't you explain that? Because the people didn't even understand it. That before, you know, somebody you had the opportunity, and if, if fifteen percent of the people purchased within the building, you had the conversion right. Okay, you had the opportunity to own a piece of New York City right. over there as a co-op. Right. Now that rule went to 51%. 51%. Someone was dyslexic. Right, which is... Right, they turned it around. <laughs> and it's only people who live in the building, right? Right. I believe it's only and, people who and, live in the building. And, they, so, and how do you get to 51%? I mean, you really... It, it's quite a hardship. To that's get under, to 15% so percent that, means you have to, that means you have to get... You have to produce a, a building that's like half vacant and then get the people to... Yeah, without, without crossing warehousing and right. things of that nature. Well, Very what, difficult. Uh, you know, it, so they're discouraging ownership even on the, on the side of tenancy. They're discouraging ownership. No, you shouldn't own a piece of it. You're better off to be a rent stabilized. Okay, tenant. certain lenders. Okay, lenders. Okay, which could be banks, could be individuals who provided, as we might call, hard money lenders or alternative lenders who were lending money to individuals who, you know, somebody bought a building. They wanted to have the opportunity to buy that eight, eight apartment building in, in Brooklyn, okay? They couldn't get a bank because banks wanted to do larger loans. So they went to an alternative lender, okay? Uh, alternative lender could be somebody put together of a small syndicate over there. Right now, they're in the middle of renovations. We don't know what happens. What's gonna happen to that? Those are in serious trouble. Um, I've gotten calls from my lenders and I told them, look, when, it's, when you're lending on cash flow, you're good. Um, and that's one of the things, thankfully, we've been able to do over the years is just keep our loan to values relatively low so that we could, and we've been conservative about the money that we borrowed. However, for the people that couldn't borrow like that and went out and got, you know, hard short-term loans to do big apartment turnovers that now can't happen, I don't know. I don't even know how you recover well, those. What about security deposits? What's new under the rules for security deposits? So, so now the rule for security deposits is you're only allowed to collect one month of security. That's going to have a, a, a very challenging effect on certain tenants who don't have credit. Maybe they have foreign credit. Um, you know, they, well, they don't have domestic credit. Um, they don't have a guarantor. 
um, it's going to cause a lot of people not to be able to access apartments because it's just not enough security uh, for a landlord to be comfortable. I mean, they did some petty things too, like dropping application fees from, yeah, you know, to twenty dollars maximum. Why? I mean, filing for a credit report could, is more than twenty dollars. Well, that's that's you know they say roughly it's it's uh, the cost. That's roughly, that's roughly the cost. So they're basically saying that, that but you have to have people review. Right, you, you don't have, to have, have people any collect documents. people have, overhead on, on it, that side. But you know, I mean, the DOB collects a hundred bucks for a simple permit. But, but the we, <laughs> the added uh, condition, as he's talking about, is the credit report is also amended to if you have a bad tenant with a bad. Uh, history of being a bad tenant. Now that could be there, there could, there could be re reasons and to mitigate certain situations that do happen in a tenant's life or anyone's life for that matter. But if you if you don't pay your American Express, you can let that you don't have to rent to that tenant. They're a credit risk. But if they didn't pay rent, or well, they were a holdover tenant, or they blew the building up. You have to, and they, they, you're almost obligated to take, I think you're obligated to take uh, them as not, a tenant. You you're can't, not allowed to blacklist anybody. Right. You can't look at if they had a landlord-tenant uh, case. Right. Right. You assume that it must have been the landlord's fault, I guess, and not the tenant's, right? right. So right. it's kind of crazy. Now, what's the rules with regard to refunding the money to the tenants or reducing the rents for the major capital improvements over a period of time, over 30 years? So I think it's two questions. I think, right. I think so any individual apartment improvements or major capital improvements burn off after 30 years. So right. any, any increases that you... So what happens if Joe, because he's the oldest in the group with regard to ownership of apartments, 25 years ago you renovated apartments, you got the major capital improvement money over there. Under the new regulations, you have to reduce your rent? I mean, that's an interpretation. After 30 years, yes. Right, so if you renovated a property in 1985, okay, right now we're at, it's a 30, it's a 24, 34 years, 34 year period, under the new rules, you have to give the money back and reduce the rent. I'm not sure if, if well, you would calculate it that way. I think you would burn it off on, a, on an amortized basis. So I think it's for new improvements. I don't think they're looking back at old improvements. No, the if question are, is, you know, certain people have said to me about they the are. System. You're talking about how, how you actually calculate that, that right. process. I would think that it would be like a, a burn off of an amortization over that period of time. You're actually burning it off with every tenant that goes. So here's along. the question. People thing. put money into, into buildings. People put money in the bank to earn interest, okay? Why, uh, why should an individual who pr before believed in investing into New York City should buy an apartment house that has these controls? They probably today shouldn't. If, if these laws stand, uh, they shouldn't unless they could steal the property. Um, There's a price for everything. Else. Yeah, exactly. And, and the other thing is, and I know most landlords and most guys I deal with, we love the mosaic of New York, the diversity. And what hurts me and what hurts most of the people I'm talking to more than anything is just seeing the jobs that are being lost. Thousands of people already have been laid off. There's going to be tens of thousands more. And that hurts us the most because that's going to hurt the city. We love, when you're a capitalist, you're a compassionate capitalist, you love the city. You want everyone to go up with you. Exactly. What about the Israeli bond market who financed a number of these deals? where they've done them based on projected revenues of movement. Where do you see that happening? From what I know about the Israeli bond market, uh, a lot of the, the underwriting happened on, on the uh, developers' expected profits. Um, so that's... Expected profits. Of the that's developer. Exactly of the developer. So that really, at this point, I mean, and the developer's profits usually happen after the equity. Um, so, so that was a difficult... Okay, but to, didn't we talk in the green room, we were talking that some of your people that you know, maybe yourselves or other property, your investors came from Europe around the world. These people wanted to invest in New York City. Today, reading the articles, picking up any of the publications, also the interpretations, which most people, including yours, truly doesn't understand completely, how are you going to get somebody to say, I want to invest? We Look, free market apartments are still free market apartments, and uh, that's where people are going to focus. And there's also... I have a question for you. You just say free market apartments are free market apartments today. You know what? The rules can change also. Absolutely. 
What happened with the, for, the affordable New York? They tried. Okay? What happens over there when they change the rules? You have changes in the government and rules can change overnight. Yeah, and I think the rules can change back. You really, you are an optimist. I, uh, look, that's what I'm here for. Aaron? Um, I think that there has to be a political operation, and I think there's going to probably be some legal challenges also that are going to come out soon. But uh, I'm an optimist because of the character of New York, but the way the laws are written, I think they have to be overturned to go back to the old days. Steve, you represent a number of owners. What's, what's their thoughts of this June 14th uh, dilemma, as I call it? Um, you know, for the clients that we manage properties for that we're counting on certain increases by improving apartments, it's, um, it's, a, it's a bloodbath. I mean, they, they, their investment strategy is uh, decimated. Um, but on the whole, I, th I think Albert alluded to before, it, it, if, you, if, you, if you have existing cash flow and that's what you bought on, um, you should be okay. You know, you should be okay. What they're thinking is that their business models are going to have to change now. So he, but here's the question. Opera, you know, the, the rent guideline board have just approved a one and a half and a two and a half percent increase. Yes. Real estate taxes have increased. Insurance costs have increased. Water and sewer have increased. Your labor costs have increased because of the additional labor rules under the minimum wage, one, coupled with the vacation pay, two, sick leave, three. So now I don't see these operating expenses. Where, where, yep. where are they going to come up from? You, you know what's going to happen also? The city is going to lose property tax revenue. It's the biggest source of this, revenue. The, it, it, Why are they going to lose it? I just want... To because, explain it to my audience more. Because property taxes are calculated based on rental revenues and property operating expenses are taken into account. That's how assessments are done. This is going to lower net operating income of almost every stabilized property across the city. You can't tax a building into foreclosure. Why not? Well, they could try. And then the city, you know. But ultimately, where is that revenue going to come from? It's not, it can't, you can't squeeze uh, water from a stone. That's why I think things are going to change. The law also, the law also, in, by its own default, almost by its own default, the new law, literally all uh, conveys um, a tenant life estate trusts within the rent stabilized apartment. They literally transfer what ownership owns into the right of the tenant. They don't have to move out. They don't have to deal with anything. They go to court, they have representation, and they can continue to pass along an asset that becomes an asset, actually, that they don't own. They didn't pay for it. They don't own it. And, and, and that part, I don't think we maybe as a group have really looked into how serious that condition really is. That's a very, very serious condition. Because they're basically saying, you don't need to buy an apartment. There's no reason for you to, to, to buy anything. You can't buy you an already apartment own under it. the co-op conversion law. But you already own okay. it in a, in, a, in a very different way. You, you, you own create, it. Yeah. You know, there's more tenants than landlords, right? So they think that with the regulations that they passed win them more votes, right? If, but, if the goal is, but if the goal is truly affordable housing, which is a good goal, it's a worthy goal, and I think as New Yorkers, we want there to be affordable housing. We understand that there are we young need people. Affordable we housing. need it. That's, absolutely. That's a mandatory requirement absolutely. in the city of New York. We that's need what absolutely. more affordable so, housing. So you know what we need to look at? We need the private to sector of affordable Rent housing. Rent stabilization so, is the private sector of affordable housing. And exactly. what they're trying to do now almost resembles Havana 1951. They didn't fire one bullet on the 14th. They came in and they took it over. This is a takeover. If this is a takeover of personal property, they literally are taking over the property because you have no rights. We, we cannot even negotiate with a tenant. If a tenant came and said, I want to move out, like the, the lady that Aaron's talking about, I'm ready to go, I would like to move out, write me my check. I can't. If, if the government truly wants to have more affordable housing, you don't do it by beating up the people in the industry who work really hard who actually work really hard to maintain properties, to renovate properties, to take care of tenants. You know, I, I mean, you when, know, you look at, when you look at some of these older buildings and you see new windows, so the drafts aren't there. You, you see the renovations over there. You know, you had 100-year-old bathrooms. They're not going to do it. The plumbing wasn't there. 
these refrigerators, you know, you have new refrigerators, you have energy, energy efficiency, okay? You're not going to have that anymore. You go to these older buildings, they have the fuse boxes. People are going to keep the fuse boxes over there. There was an actual renaissance in every neighborhood. Every neighborhood experienced the upgrade of a better place to live. And it was done by people who paid rent and people who invested in those neighborhoods. The group that's sitting here today, and probably a lot of people that are going to be watching your show, this show, that's not what they own. They own the little properties yes. in the corner. Yes, yes. Five-story walk up. The little old lady that still sweeps in front of her, her, her home, her little four-family uh, brownstone in, in Brooklyn. Right, and that's the key. The person who wanted to own a piece of the rock, who had the opportunity when somebody sold the building, when the 80-year-old wanted to sell the estate, that opportunity is no longer going to be there because if you have rent-stabilized apartments, nobody's going to go into it right now. Yeah. So the opportunities are, are really difficult. And I think, you know, this show is going to air in a couple of weeks. And then uh, come back in the fall, I want to bring all of you back to talk about maybe there are changes. Maybe people are going to be as positive as Albert that the world is going to be great. But right now, my apple is very dull and not shiny. And I'd like to thank Joe, Steve, Albert, and Mr. Young Rice over there, Aaron, for being here. And I'll see you next week. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.